a bound oxygen, and then these red curves of oxy hemoglobin, and this is for the hemoglobin. And you can see this is the absorption coefficient, but it's in log scale. So you go a factor of 10, 100,000 before you reach that region, which is the region that we use for two photon excitation. So it's very important that you uh, try to excite in this region, because in this region, you will not have any penetration. Then other absorption occurs, and one is melanin, which occurs essentially in some specific cell in the skin. Then you have scattering, which changes as a function of wavelength, and the farther you go from uh, um, essentially longer wavelength, the less is the scattering, and I consider that a relay scattering because mean scattering is also modulated here, and then you have water. A water absorbs and absorbs because those are the overtone of the uh, fundamental uh, IR frequencies of the of water and arise because the water is uh, a lack of symmetry of water. And, and then you can see that, for example, between uh, this wavelength and then it will go down again and, 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 and the wavelength that we want to excite, there is almost a factor of uh, let us say, a, a factor of 100 or more. So clearly, there is only one window that you can use in tissue unless you go much higher in frequency, which is the region between, let us say, 600 nanometer and 1200 nanometer. All the rest of water will have start to absorb and everything else will start to absorb. So this is the, the window that we have to hit. And this is the, the lessons that we have can uh, do excitation in all this window, but the emission has to be in that region, otherwise it, it, the photons will not come out. So let us see what happens, and I will uh, consider some important parameters. So we have an excitation, and the excitation penetrate enough, provide has a, is a two photon excitation, and has a, a wavelength which will transmit in the medium. Then the this is in focus fluorescence, but the, as you go deeper and deeper, you have to increase the laser power in order to obtain some signal, because otherwise the laser will be attenuated, and they will be attenuated according to some equation I will discuss in a second. But the important thing is that if you increase the laser power too much, the a surface of the sample starts to emit two photons. So that becomes the source of fluorescence, and then you will see only the slope. So let us see what are the important things. So the important things are the uh, anisotropy of the scattering. So a factor that tells us if the scattering is isotropic or anisotropic. And then we have the mean free path for scattering, which is called the scattering coefficient. And then we have a, a reduced scattering coefficient, which is the quantity we will use, which is the scattering coefficient, which is generally is on the order of uh, 50 micron at the most. And then you multiply by one minus G, which is the scattering coefficient. So clearly if G is one, well, we will not have any uh, reduced scattering coefficient, but if G is close to zero, which means that the, the factor of scattering is isotropic, then you can have a, a very large uh, uh, reduced scattering coefficient. I say this is the important quantity. And the important quantity is essentially how much the light will penetrate uh, to, before it becomes uh, oriented in any possible direction. And uh, I say the inverse of nu s is called the scattering and uh, mean free path, and the inverse of the New prime is called the transport MF, uh, MFP. So mean free path that is what we will have. So in general, for tissues like can be the brain or or, or muscle or whatever, uh, we have that G is on the order of 0 0.6 to 0 0.9. So the, after few collision with the particles of the medium, the, the scattering becomes isotropic. And then that gives us a mean free path, reduced mean free path which is on the order of five to 15 centi per centimeter. So this is still very large and we will have to deal with that. 
So what it says here, only unscattered photon, which induce for two photon uh, in focus, uh, will remain or will produce highly re a, a, a resolution imaging because the spot that you use for excitation becomes is still very small. Okay, so now let us see what is the limitation. So the limitation is that you have to penetrate down and the penetration depends on the scattering coefficient, not the reduced scattering coefficient. And then the fluorescence intensity decreases as a function of that, but decreases because is the excitation. So the excitation, there is nothing, nothing you can do. And that is due to the fact that the, in excitation, you need still to maintain a very nar narrow beam because otherwise you will not obtain second two photon excitation. So uh, essentially to compensate for the, si the signal decrease, which is there is nothing you can do uh, as a function of Z, as a function of the penetration, you can increase the total intensity of the laser. But there is a limit because then the surface will start to emit. Okay, so let's go now to the next thing. There is another effect in uh, that limits the thing, is the fact that uh, suppose you have a, a plane wave, which is generated by the laser, and you pass through the medium. Well, passing through the medium, you can find different regions of index of refraction, uh, and that will deform very much the front. And that deform deformation of the front will make impossible to focus uh, the, the beam at a given depth. So in order to do that, we use uh, uh, adaptive optics and simply we deform, origin, uh, we deform the plane wave before entering into the sample in such a way that it will converge in a, in a, in a, uh, in a point. And I will not discuss that because this is, I say, more or less standard uh, although in a scattering medium, it's not, it's not so easy to do. Okay, so let's go to the uh, conventional rapid detection. As I say, assuming that you can excite something, okay, you can still have a limit because you collect only the photons uh, emitted in one region. And that region is small compared to the total solid angle in which you can collect. So this is, uh, uh, so people try, people understood that, and they try to do different kinds of things. So for example, one thing is try to collect uh, uh, the light using a parabolic mirror. And this is uh, uh, work done years ago. And they claim they can have a factor between uh, five and two gains as a function of that, uh, as you go that. But this is actually two is the maximum they show. The other possibility is to use fiber optics and collect all around. But you will see that this is also, a, in, in the paper, they describe that in principle, you can get a factor of four signal gain, but in practice, they obtain no more than, than a factor of two. Okay, so now let us come to the idea of the diver. And this is the fundamental idea. So the fundamental idea of the diver is that instead of fighting and, and trying to increase a little bit the angle of collection in this region, we decide to go through the sample. And those are the real quantities that we are in interested. So you can excite and they say the excitation uh, will decrease as a function of C, there is nothing you can do, but you can increase very much the amount of light collected if you have a very high, so you collect by transmission and you collect a, a, in a very wide angle. So the, not only very high angle, but as you can see that the deeper you excite, the larger will be the angle of, col of collection. So it, it is counterintuitive that the deeper you go, the more light you will get in this, in this method. And those are more or less uh, uh, sizes, uh, two sizes, so it's about, uh, uh, um, about 20 to 25 millimeter uh, in, uh, uh, so two and a half centimeter. And the depth we want to reach is on the order of a millimeter. And using this, this method, I will show in a moment, you can obtain up to a factor of 1,000 uh, uh, collection or in terms of signal. The other thing that you have to be very careful is that for this method to work, so if the angle of this photon 
heat in that part is such that it will exceed the, the critical angle, it will be reflected. So you will not be able to collect. So it's, it is important that the, there is a matching of the index of the uh, refraction in all the, all the points in and of the, of the sample, including that surface, including that surface, including all the surface. And this is simply shown here that, for example, if you have a, 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 a slide, a series of slides, and you have air gap, you will see very little transmission true. But if you have water in between, which is not as much, only partially, the index of refraction of the glass, you can see much better. And this is the principle we will use. So you have to be careful that, that there, if the, the major factor is the matching of the index of refraction. The other major factor is that you, you don't want the, the scattered light from the laser to reach the photodetector because you will saturate completely the photodetector. So you need to put here some filters that will completely cut the laser light, but has to be complete. And, and this is the, the way it works. So we have a, a, so here we have the sample and then we have the, the detector here. And then we have a series of filters here. And first of all, we have two barrier filters, which are BG39 filters, and each of one at the wavelength of the laser attenuate about 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 times. So two of them will attenuate 20, 10 to the 12, which is sufficient not to see the laser. The other thing is that we have need to have matching of the index of refraction. So the filter that we use in order to select the fluorescent cannot be an interference filter, so cannot have sharp thing. And we have to use the glass filter because the glass filter are independent on the, well, well, the table independent of the angle of XAD. And this is the size of the detector we use. But remember that from here, from the sample to the detector, it, it's all transparent in the sense that we match all the angles of effect. So whatever is the angle of a photon will still arrive to the detector. This is very important. So this is now how the system looks like. So it looks like a normal microscope. We have an epi detector. We have a, a detector uh, in, the, in, in the transmission. Here is where we put the sample. And we have this uh, uh, group velocity compensator, which is important in order to get the narrow pulse. And then we have two detectors, an epi detector and the we call what we call the, api, um, the diver detector. And then we can position the sample and so on. So now we will make a, a, a comparison between the light that can be collected in a normal microscope, so to the epi detector, and the light which is collected with the diver by transmission. And uh, so those are simple, um, uh, those are how the, the system works for. So it's essentially a, a plate here is the detector, here is the motor to move the filter wheel and to select, and there are several that we build for several people. But now let us make a comparison between what we can observe with the diver as a function of depth. And the depth uh, we measure in this example up to about two millimeter, so 2000 micron. And so let us see what happens. So suppose we have a transparent media. You say, why we want to use anything like that? Well, you want to use because the, the deeper you go, even in a transparent media, the more light we will collect. And for example, uh, if you can, even in a, in a medium which is about two uh, millimeter, you can collect about a factor of five, this is log scale, so a factor of five more light. So it is will be convenient for every kind of media because simply, uh, the detector detects more light because simply has a larger aperture. And I don't know how to calculate the aperture there, be, but because it's not the normal aperture of the detector, but it's essentially a half of the solid angle. But then what happens if we are scattering? So if we are scattering in the epi detector, this is normalized to the epi detector, we collect very little. And, uh, but with this method, we don't have any, or we can collect, well, you can see here, this is a factor of 10, a factor of 100, a factor of 1,000. So we can collect almost a factor of 1,000 more light. And that makes a difference, okay? 
remember we are in a very highly scattering media and very uh, very dirt and you can collect uh, that amount and that curve can continue so if you continue this curve you continue down and then you can collect an enormous amount of light if you have very high scattering it is even better of course the more scattering you have the better it is because the comparison between the light that will be going up to respect to the light that will go down of course is in favor of the light that will will be collected by by the diver detectors as we call so this is the sample uh, so this is for example a, a comparison between the ap detection and, and and the diver detector so essentially as you go deeper and deeper you don't change neither the resolution nor the, the amount of light and you can go easily up to more than two millimeters and this is the kind of sample that we we use so you cannot see true impossible to see true but it contains beads and other things and still you can image those things very well okay so uh, let us take a tissue sample for example this is a brain sample and you can see the soma and the neurons here and uh, uh, so in, if you use the AP detector, you cannot get more than about 100, 200 microns. And this is because you excite in uh, two photon excitation. If you have only one photon excitation, you will be limited to much, to about uh, 50 microns here. But in the diver, you can go down, 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 down. And uh, essentially at the limit, you lose resolution because you are limited by the uh, changes within the cell refraction but you still can, can see very large number of photons at very large depth. Okay, so in order to compensate for the uh, wavefront, we use a, an adaptive optics method, as I said, which is made of a series of, of 32 mirrors, about 37. And those are the mirror, and each mirror can be moved in three, so can be moved in X, Y, so can be moved, uh, along the z-axis so this is important because it might be at the periphery you have to displace the mirror much more and then can tilt in x and y so it's three degrees of freedom for everything and so we have 37 mirrors we have a total of 103 three, uh, um, degrees of freedom the stroke so the amount that we can move in the z is 3.5 micron this is important I have to be more than than the, the wavelength and uh, the total aperture of the system is about uh, 3.8 micron and the speed in which you can change the image or whatever the shape of the of the mirror is about 100 kilohertz and they are faster system uh, they get up to about 200 kilohertz and this is very important because essentially you can use that system not only to comp you have to use to compensate for the wavefront, but you can also use to to focus a beam. Okay. So, uh, so let us see uh, what is happen if uh, if we change, for example, the thickness of the sample, and uh, uh, and we have different kinds of. So I say we have no absorption, of course. Uh, still you gain signal but the larger is the absorption and the larger is the scattering you have to compensate otherwise you will not be able to uh, focus the, the incoming light there is nothing you can do on the incoming light other than focus it better and this is a way to focus it better and uh, so uh, to give you an idea so people are very glad if they can measure through a zebra fish but he, here is a, a, a mammal okay so we have a, a, a baby rat a baby baby mouse this is the objective we have a, 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 a essentially things containing a solvent here you know which is not in contact with the animal but it's simply to match the index of refraction and then we can uh, measure the skin or or we can go through completely uh, that small animal okay so this is the, the kind of things you can do and open up the possibility to measure uh, tissues okay which are essentially impossible to measure under any other condition and those are other examples uh, in which we increase the uh, 
the field of total field of view and to give you an idea so this is a, a slice of a, a rat lung uh, this is a mouse bone so not that this is one millimeter so from here to here we are talking about uh, uh, 10 uh, millimeters so so we are talking about more than a centimeter and this is a, a, a mouse kidney and so on. So, and you can measure all those parts. But this is not only important that you do the image, but we will see much, much more importance. So first of all, the uh, photomultiplier of the uh, diver is connected to a flint box. So we can measure uh, core, we can measure the lifetime. And in this experiment, we have a sample which is about a centimeter thick. And we have, um, in order to simulate scattering, we have a um, particle of TO2, which is simply is white. And then we add dyes, well, actually those are a, a fluorescence bead. And then in solution, the fluorescence bead will have a four nanosecond, rhodamine B is 1.7 and rose bengal, so they have three different colors. So if you measure the intensity, this is the intensity you measure with the diver. So you see that the resolution does not change very much as you go deep, but you can measure perfectly well uh, the, the flim uh, in this particular sample. And then you can see that uh, you can get, for example, the orange bead and the yellow bead that you can separate very well just by flim. And this is important because that, that means that we can do out of fluorescence of tissue uh, as you will see in a moment. So you can do, uh, for example, if you consider a sample, which is a, a clinical sample, which is a, a flat mouse liver, you can obtain all the uh, 3D and uh, well, 2D and 3D information all the lifetime. And this is, for example, of a, a mouse embryo eyes as it develops. You can obtain all the information about the uh, lifetime in the different parts of the eyes. The, so so you, you, can make, you can increase the, not really the, the optical resolution, but you can increase the co information content of the image just by measuring a, a simply the, the lifetime. Okay, as I showed you. So the other thing that is very, very important is that a, the measure of harmonic generation, which is not fluorescence. I will explain in a little bit what it is. So you have a, a, a light which is coming through. And remember the electric, electric vector of the light will oscillate in this direction. And if you have molecules, uh, which can, in, in the molecules, you will always move the electrons because the electrons are, are light. You will not move the nucleus, but a, by moving the electron, the electron will generate a wave and the wave will preferentially go in the same direction of the incoming uh, wavelength, but it's not, you never reach a, 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 an absorption. So this is wavelength which is below the absorption of the material. And many materials, for example, collagen, myosin, and nerves, etc., cetera, uh, have a, a harmonic generation. And the harmonic generation is a general phenomenon. It always happens when a light passes through a medium and you move the direction. So in this example, we have two millimeters of a scattering layer. This is the, the picture. We have a crystal of urea, which generates second harmonic generation. And then another, so it's total is four millimeter. And so this is what you will measure with epi uh, detector, so it's nothing or very, very little, but you can see very, very well, very sharp images of the urea crystal, which emit second harmonic generation. So uh, those are examples of second harmonic generation. For example, these, uh, these are uh, in the muscle in which you have a, a myosin and you can see uh, the, this characteristic structure of the muscle. Those are uh, collagen fibers, as I show you. And then something which is very interesting is that collagen, for example, just has also second harmonic generation, collagen one, but collagen three, for example, has no second harmonic generation, but has a, a fluorescence. And so we can distinguish immediately the 
fluorescence from second hormone bond generation, which means we can do a spectroscopy of the collagens, which are related to different diseases in bones or in muscle or in any organ in an animal. And uh, for example, here we can see an animal which has fibrosis. Uh, we'll describe more in detail that. And you can see the fibers, the uh, collagen fibers. And this is a normal animal, has a little bit, but it is completely different than the other. Okay, so let us see this effect of third morning generation, which I start to talk with people. And so the third morning ge generation is caused by a essential tripling the wavelength of excitation by moving the electrons in the media. And that always happened, has nothing to do with, with biology. And, but it's very strong uh, at the interface between a material and the other to have diff very different reserve function. For example, this is a, a liver, normal liver. Uh, this is 25 micron, so. And then you can see a, a, a liver with a, a normal versus fat a diet. And you can see here the collection, you can analyze all those, uh, um, uh, the size of the particles that we see. In the adipose tissue, you have, because adipose tissue has a lot of fat, of course, and then you can see a very strong separation due to the third harmonic generation. So in this case, the laser is at 1040, and the third harmonic generation will be one third of that wavelength, which will be 347 nanometer, which is generally something you don't see in any microscope because the, because the uh, objective of the microscope will not or will very uh, will not generate will not pass the light if you have a nerve for example and you can see here a uh, autofluorescence which is in that color and then you can see the third harmonic generation in red which is the surface of the nerve and then you can see in green, we have also a lot of second harmonic generation. And this is the surface of the nerve and so on. But for example, in bacteria also, a bacteria has a membrane outside, and then there is a very strong second harmonic generation. And so you can observe a bacteria simply by third harmonic generation. Of course, you can observe also by fluorescence and so on. But here you can see the membrane. A, and, and not the fluorescence of the center. Okay, so uh, you can also do three photon fluorescence imaging, and uh, this work is done with uh, David Jameson and uh, Greg Reiner. And uh, we wanted to 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 show that actually you can do FCS uh, with this. So the sensitivity is so so large that you can do FCS and you can get autocorrelation function for. Uh, third morning generation, which means you can see the fluorescence, for example, of a, a, you excite equivalent of 280 nanometer, and you can see the fluorescence of tryptophan. And this is also something unique. I think nobody has ever done proteins in, in uh, but directly exciting the tryptophan of the protein. Okay. So then finally, I will talk about the sine and cosine filter, and let us see how it works. So, uh, remember that the definition in the phase of plot of G and S is that you have a, a cosine and the sine function. So cosine is for the G and sine is for the S. And then you have here the intensity as a function of wavelength multiplied by a, a, a trigonometric function divided by the total intensity. So the idea is that this is the product of the intensity times, times the transmission of a filter. And if we have a pure cosine filter, then we can directly measure all this quantity, which is actually all this quantity, which is here in the numerator of this equation, just by hardware, just by transmission of the filter, uh, the transmission of the filter. This is total intensity. The other part is total intensity, which of course is without the filter. Okay. so. Uh, now, that will work if you have an ideal filter. So if you have a filter which transmit exactly like a cosine and exactly like a sine. But we don't have that, or what actually we have now, but we don't have and we have filters which are up 
approximately, let us say something which looks like a, a cosine a, and something that looks like a sine. Remember that one important thing is that a transmission of the filter cannot go negative. Why here we need a function that goes negative in order because the cosine in a period will go to plus one minus one. Well, that is very easy to do in the sense that you subtract, uh, uh, you multiply by two and subtract one, and then that would be a perfect cosine filter. So is this possible mathematically by measurement of the transmission of the filter to build the GNS coordinate, but they need this, this transformation. And now let us see how it works. So it works in the following way. So uh, uh, as was said many times, uh, you can see in, in the case uh, uh, plot, for example, the smaller will be the phase, the bluer will be the emission. So that will be Kumarin, EGFP, Kumarin 6, uh, Rhodamin uh, 110, Rhodamin 6G, and Rhodamin B. And you can see very well that all the colors uh, appear not as a spectrum, which is wider, etc., but appears as a point here. This is very important because if you have another point which is at a, at a given distance, you can distinguish. While you cannot distinguish two spectra that differ between one nanometer, or one, it becomes very, very difficult. But here you have points. And this is, this is very important. And uh, so in some way, the, the diver has this capability, not only to do like time at every single point, but using the sine and cosine filter, which are in the, in, in just in the filter wheel, uh, to produce directly the, the spectra of the, of the sun. This is a, might be something even more important than measure the lifetime because the uh, lifetime, so the spectra seems to be much more sensitive to the environment that is, or, or the small changes that is the lifetime. So in the diver, we have this capability. Uh, and so the diver is a, is a method to measure uh, samples up to a depth of the order of three, four millimeter, which is really unattainable by any other method and uh, has a capability to do lifetime and has also the capability to measure spectra. And I think all things together are really uh, extraordinary uh, uh, achievement for an instrument. So this is Sasha, who is uh, the person who developed uh, this uh, instrument, those are other people in TLFT. Uh, and uh, uh, well, I want to thank you for your attention and for, you know, for listening to me in this presentation. Thank you very much. Great, Enrico. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's, uh, Felipe, has some... Felipe has a question. He's already... Uh... Yes, already. Hi, hi Enrico. Um, Thank you for the presentation, uh, really amazing stuff. Uh, I see that uh, in the diver you use uh, the regular or the most uh, popular fluorescent proteins as uh, genetically encoded uh, 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 sensors, but uh, I wonder if you consider using any red fluorescent protein or infrared uh, fluorescent protein that well, obviously have an advantage. Uh, remember that in the range of the diver, we need to limit the wavelength. Uh, okay, I don't know whether I have that, but uh, so when you transmit it to the diver, you need to have, uh, you need to block the laser. So, uh, so essentially, this is very important. That you need to, so here it is. So we block the laser using, and those filters need to have a very, very high absorption. And those filters need to be glass filter, cannot be interference filter. So by, by the so we found that the BG39 filter, the attenuate a factor of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 each. So the sum of the two will be 10 to the 12. And that is sufficient to completely abolish the laser. Uh, because the laser, you know, is clearly very powerful. And if we go through, we'll delete. So uh, in some way, we can change those filters and put filters which are more interred, so that we can use more interred. But this configuration is safe. Everybody can use and you will never damage the instrument because otherwise, you know, you will send the laser directly into the detector. Still, you can go to 650, more or less, Felipe. 650 is the limit of it. It is what actually, 
it's about uh, 650. Excitation, right? Excitation. We're talking about excitation. The mission of me. Well, mission. the mission also is limited. You can go up to 650 in emission. Okay. Yes. In the station, you can go the wavelength you want. You don't have nothing in the in optical. Station, you can go the wavelength you want because it's multi photon excitation. In fact, we, we can do 1.3 microns, whatever. Yeah. So I don't know. It is, it is a, 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 a limit, but you know, its limit is, is done for protection. And it's not done because there is any intrinsic limit. So we decide to have an instrument that we can open to the public and, and people use it. Yeah, but uh, I, I was just saying because uh, red for, uh, the red wavelengths uh, usually have better penetration, as you described in your starting yeah. slides. Say that, you know, uh, this, is, this is a part which is changeable. We can put any filter we want. We have filters yeah. that transmit, uh, you know, fluorescence in the red and so on. But essentially, you know, we, we base everything on autofluorescence. Most of the things are autofluorescent okay. and second and third harmonic generation. But yes, you're right. There is not, nothing that prevents to remove those filters and substitute with filters which are more interrelated. Okay, thank you. Enrico, there is another question from Benjamin that say, uh, the third harmonic generation depends on refractive index decreases uh, and also to the properties of the interface itself is a question. Let's say in case of- well, Yes, uh, okay, so because, uh, so the point is the following, uh, that we are measuring by transmission. So we want that the light which is transmitted to, to be in, in a space relationship with the light which is exciting. But that depends on the, on the uh, surface and so on. For example, uh, if you have a, a, a membrane which is flat, you will have the harmonic generation which transmit like that. But if the membrane has a bump, uh, it, will, it will start to transmit different, uh, so the, the third harmonic generation is very different. And so actually you can see there is a paper by Chiara Stringer in which they measure very, very small curvature of a membrane. Okay, because yes, it is sensitive. It's a very good question, yes. Great, uh, Enrico Lorenzo is already here. Uh, we will okay. have her on also for the breakout rooms. My, my sharing, I think. Yeah, I, I already stopped it. So, oh, okay. um, Lorenzo, now you can, I think, unmute yourself and share your screen. Meanwhile, I introduce you. Okay, Lorenzo, Dr. Lorenzo Gipioni is postdoc actually at the Laboratory for Fluorescent Dynamics at the Biomedical Engineering working with Enrico. Uh, he's an expert in FCS related techniques. During the, uh, his PhD, he developed several techniques. As uh, I said before, he was a former PhD of uh, Luca Lanzano. And he, during the PhD, he did clicks and he did also the iris scan detector for FCS with the nano camera that I spoke at the beginning of the talk. He will, he will talk about this later on today in the afternoon. And uh, in the last year or so, he's developing a new microscope, which is uh, known as the spectral film, which is based on this kind of uh, spectral detector or nano cameras, which is truly parallel hyperspectral film. Uh, this is, a, I think, a wonderful microscope. It's the dream for every everyone that want to do uh, um, um, basically the polar relaxation on all these complicated photophysics. Uh, it's a good friend of mine. Uh, we spend with Alex uh, a lot of time together because we share the office, uh, and I always found very nutritive and, and, and fruitful all our discussion and in, in instrumentation and method, and I learned quite a lot from, from him too. So, Lorenzo, I pass the word to you, and uh, you are now ready to go. Thanks, Lionel, for the introduction. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Perfect. All right. So, um, as Lionel mentioned, um, my talk today will be about this new microscope um, that we developed. It's called the Phaser S-FLIM, S-FLIM standing for Spectral Fluorescence Lifetime Imaging Microscope. So uh, just to, uh, we, we, you've probably seen this a thousand times so during this workshop, but let's go through it once more. So uh, a, a simple model for a fluorophore photophysics uh, is uh, described by the Jablonski diagram. 
So you have basically a series, a distribution of wavelengths that can be absorbed by your fluorophore. Uh, then the system relaxes uh, by emitting a, a distribution of uh, longer wavelengths. And the distribution of this wavelength is what is called the emission spectrum, uh, which is what you typically use for uh, to like uh, design a multicolor experiment, for instance. And these are usually relatively broad in the order of tens of nanometers. Or something. Um, one other property, which is um, relatively uh, less uh, exploited, is the fluorescence lifetime, uh, which is the um, probability of uh, the distribution probability of the fluorescence emission. So basically, how much time it takes for this process to happen. And uh, it has the uh, uh, the shape of an exponential decay, the, the constant of which is called the fluorescence lag. So typically, so these information are very useful because they allow you to characterize uh, the fluorophore. They're also, um, they can also be used like to probe the environment uh, if you have a specific fluorophore which changes this property according to the, uh, its surroundings. Um, the problem is that usually this, uh, none of these properties is exploited by uh, regular uh, microscopes because it's usually averaged out um, in, the, in the detector. The detector just collects over a spectral range and it gives you one value, which is the accumulation of the photons that are emitted in the probe in that position. So, some of the detectors have the capability of measuring fluorescence lifetime. You've seen it throughout all the presentation that have been given during this workshop as well. Uh, but typically, there is no access to the spectral emission. Um, some other architectures um, have uh, a grating, diffraction grating, which splits the light by color. And then it can be uh, detected by um, a spectral, uh, an array, a detector array of several detectors, as you can see here. So this detector will collect the blue light, this detector will collect the red, and the, the integration of the photons collected in this detector, this one, and so on, will give you the emission spectrum. What we did was uh, uh, taking the, this a step further, uh, which is coupling this uh, uh, spectral detector with uh, an electronics which allows to uh, measure the fluorescence lifetime for each of these detectors. So now our microscopy images, instead of being uh, uh, X by Y as all the microscopy images, these are now X by Y by lifetime by lambda. So we have a 4D array rather than a 2D. And in every pixel, uh, this is what every pixel looks like. So it, it's a matrix called the time resolved emission spectrum or TRES, in which you have uh, the spectral channel and uh, the temporal decay in the, in the nanosecond. So the accumulation of all the photons along the temporal dimension will give you this. This is the steady state emission spectrum. Uh, whereas here you can see the uh, the fluorescence lifetime for uh, each of the detector, which is the same, because in this case, it's um, this is a, a solution, this is a fluorescein. Uh, so the, the fluorescence decay does not change with uh, the spectral emission. Uh, the image size for this system is now typically uh, 256 by 256 by 256 by 32, which is the number of spectral. So also the amount of data is pretty big compared to a regular uh, image. So this is very nice. It has a lot of possibilities. So trying to, to keep this as general as possible, let's compile a, a wish list of what we would like to have from uh, such a system. So the simultaneous detection of lifetime and spectra, this is already checked. Um, uh, in our system, this uh, is um, uh, what also Lionel uh, introduces as 
um, truly parallel system. What does it mean? Uh, it means that um, compared to normal, to let's say commercially available um, choices, this is done uh, at the same time, right? So for instance, the Leica systems do spectral imaging by using narrow emission spectra, narrow emission uh, filters, sorry, and then shifting them to obtain uh, a final spectrum. This is a sequential approach, which allows actually to uh, have more flexibility, uh, but it is very slow and very uh, poor in terms of photon efficiency, because you're collecting over a narrow spectrum, then you're taking another image and you're discarding all the rest. In our case, we're not losing any photon anyway. The other properties that, uh, and we're not losing time doing so, which is also. So this is what uh, we want to, to check that uh, on, in the performance of our system. So we wanted to not only to detect the lifetime spectra, but we want to process them also with a high precision at high speed, possibly in real time, that would be a bit cool. And then we want to use all this information to know what are the underlying species in a mixed sample. Uh, we'll see then in the application why this is going to be beneficial for uh, a lot of experiments. So um, how do we process this? So of course, uh, you have learned by now that phasers can be applied to anything. So um, in our case, since we're using uh, both lifetime and spectra, let me go quickly through uh, again, through all the phase or uh, transformation. So once you, when you have your uh, fluorescence decay, which we saw, uh, which uh, I, I mentioned earlier, it's uh, an exponential decay. You can transform it into a point of the phasor space, so which will distribute along this universal semicircle, where where you have uh, the short lifetime points here, and then going counterclockwise. Uh, towards uh, uh, zero, zero, in which you have infinitely long life. Uh, an important property is, of course, the uh, linear combination, the linearity of this uh, transformation, which means that if you have a combination of two exponential decays, for instance, uh, you can um, infer what is the relative fraction of photons emitted by either of the species by looking at what is the position along the line connecting these two uh, components. Uh, the same applies to uh, any curve. Uh, it's just that the outcome is different. So for instance, for spectral images, you can see here, these are, we are simulating emission spectra with different uh, 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 maximum and uh, uh, different width. As you can see, uh, the color changes as a function of the angle, whereas the the width, the the modulation uh, changes as a function of the width of the spectrum. So broader spectra will be closer to the center, narrower spectra will be uh, farther from the center but they will all have the same dependence on, on the color. So this angle will always correspond to, the, to a blue color. This angle will always correspond to a green color. The rules of, the, of mixing uh, apply uh, as well to the, to the spectral phasor. So use, using just uh, uh, one harmonic, which is uh, the one that displays less noise, we cannot mix up to uh, three components. So as you can see here, if we have this ABC, the three, compo three pure components, any combination of these three components will uh, give rise to a point in the phasor space inside this triangle. This is going to be important later when we're going to talk about the accuracy. So this is all very nice, but actually why wouldn't we use just uh, fitting Right, fitting will give you exactly the same result. So why bother going through all of this transformation? Well, there are several advantages. So uh, the first is that 
uh, the precision in the recovery of the lifetime is pretty much comparable uh, when considering fitting, the fitting or the phasor approach. It's actually slightly more precise for the phasors. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, but that uh, is maybe. One important thing is the bias. So the bias is, um, let's say you're, you're simulating uh, 10,000 decays uh, with a known lifetime. Uh, of course, everyone will have a lot of noise. So each one will have a lot of error and whatever. But when you get the, the center of your distribution should be uh, the, the value you simulate. This is not true in, case, in the case of fitting if you have a low number of photons. So this is because um, the, the fitting procedure per se is uh, um, assuming that you have a curve with some noise on top of it. If you have a few photons, they will be just, so imagine that you have 100 photons and your decay is sampled in uh, 256 beams. Most of your, uh, of your beams will be zero. So you don't really have a curve with the noise. You have like ones and zeros. And in that case, the fitting fails. The phasers is, are based on a different approach, which is less uh, sensitive to this problem, also because it's a, it's a model-free approach. So uh, it doesn't assume that you're looking at anything uh, like an exponential or something. Uh, so this is very important, especially because uh, when you have a 4D image, as in this case, the, the number of photons available per pixel uh, decreases drastically. So you want a robust thing. But also, as I mentioned, our images are pretty big. So the time it takes to process a 256 over 256 over 256 by 32 image with the fitting is approximately 15 minutes, which is not great, compared to the phasers, which is super fast. And you can get the same result in three seconds or Three milliseconds if you can use a, a GPU acceleration, for instance. So this is really very real time. So uh, we, we can achieve high precision, we can achieve high processing speed. Let's look at the acquisition. To look at um, what can or cannot uh, delay our acquisition, processing, time, and everything, uh, let's look at how the, the microscope is built. This may be of interest for also those who tinker with the microscopy and construction and stuff. So this is our system. This is our phasor uh, S-flame microscope. Uh, the illumination coming, is coming through uh, a white laser, which uh, uh, we then uh, um, cut in order to have only the wavelengths between 400 and 660 nanometers. Uh, this white light goes into this excitation box and is split by a cascade of dichroic mirrors into four uh, excitation lines, uh, which are the common ones. Uh, we can change it with the, this the series of excitation filters if, if we want to, uh, going from 405 to 647. Then there is another cascade of dichroics that uh, that we use for uh, aligning them, uh, and we could, in principle, uh, illuminate the sample with the four uh, lines simultaneously. We typically use just one wavelength, let's say 488. The excitation light exits the uh, excitation box, and it goes through uh, the scanning part of the system, in which you have here the scanning mirrors, uh, scanner lens, and then here you have the stage and where, and where the sample will be uh, and the objective. So uh, the sample will emit the fluorescence. The fluorescence is then goes through this dichroic, through a pinhole for uh, opacity, and then it goes to the detection part of uh, our system. Um, in this configuration, we can choose between uh, a regular APD, which will just uh, integrate the light, or we can do a simple lifetime uh, with this, or through this optical fiber, uh, 
which leads to our spectral detector. Uh, the spectral detector is embedded here with a spectrograph, and here you can see this uh, small uh, black uh, thing, which is the actual detector. Where is the detector at the this uh, uh, ribbon cable, this blue cable, goes to our electronics for uh, the lifetime determination. So this is it. As you can see, uh, the spectral detector is actually downstream of everything, right? So it's in the detection part. So this uh, doesn't uh, slow down the, uh, the acquisition in any way because it's not really part of any, I mean, you can just, you can use it for instance, in principle, you could use it in any microscope. You just take away the detector you have right now, uh, you stick in the spectral detector and that's it. It's, a, it's like an add-on to any microscope. So we can, uh, we can do also high speed acquisition because uh, we are only limited by uh, the microscope we're attaching it to. So we can range from like single point measurement uh, acquiring in the nanosecond, uh, um, in nanosecond temporal intervals to seconds, milliseconds, so whatever we want. So let's see how, uh, for instance, images uh, look like with this system. So uh, Enrico presented in the, uh, in his talk before a Convalaria sample uh, with the diver, where you could see uh, differences in, uh, in spectra. And um, this is what you can see here as well. So this is a Convalaria sample, and this uh, RGB image is reconstructed by combining the 32 images uh, coming from the spectral detector. As you can see here, here we have the blue channels, the green, orange, and red. Uh, you can already see that uh, different uh, spectral windows um, are um, highlighting different structures. So for instance, the blue one, this has a sort of background-ish uh, pattern. Then you have all these uh, cells in the the green, and then you have these sort of seeds, these points of connection and stuff uh, in the red, right? Each one of these is a flim image. So imagine the, the amount of data that you collect for every frame from this microscope. It's a, it's a huge amount of data, but also a huge amount of information. In fact, uh, you can see here, this is the TRAPS the time result emission spectrum for this sample. And then you can see that the blue channels have the lifetime, the cyan sample have another one, the red is a yet another one, and yet another one in the green. So there is a huge, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in this sample. And uh, uh, it's very difficult to figure out what is actually happening because the, the emission spectrum that you see is pretty much flat. All of these decays are multi-exponential. So it, it's a very complicated sample if you want to see, to know like this is exactly what is going on. But well, the, the simplest thing that we can do, for instance, for now, is uh, let's see what the lifetime image of this looks like. So we can see a region with shorter lifetime, longer lifetime, intermediate lifetime. Uh, and we can also look at the spectral uh, phase or image uh, for this. So we have uh, red regions here, uh, the blue is in the background. And here you can see that this connection point has actually a redder spectrum and also correspond to a shorter lifetime uh, than the rest of these structures. So this is a lot of information. This could is is already powerful as is, but what we want to do is uh, take a step further and see if we can actually learn where the fluorescence is coming from. So to do this, we need a more controlled sample. In this case, we're using a, a mixture of three fluorophores. 
Uh, and this is what you get, is a relatively flat emission spectrum. You can sort of see some peaks here and uh, the, the lifetime are slightly different. So how do we, how do we process this? Um, uh, this is the, the TRAS, the time result emission spectrum. Here you have the temporal dimension, here you have the wavelength dimension. So the first step is doing a phasor transformation of, uh, in the temporal dimension. So what you give, what you get is a set of GNS coordinates for each one of the detectors. So basically the lifetime phasor position as a function of the wavelength. So this is what the um, spectral flame uh, phasor plot looks like. So you have the lifetime of the blue channels using here, then it sort of bends on the left and it goes back to uh, a short, a, another lifetime, which is even shorter. How do we, uh, how do we analyze this? So let's say that we get one of these coordinates, the S coordinates, the S coordinates. So it goes from, will go from this value, then it will decrease and it will increase again. So since we don't, we don't want to introduce any a priori knowledge on the sample, we're fitting this with uh, a generalized uh, sigmoid function, uh, which uh, well, it has a ton of parameters, um, but that's what makes it powerful. So you're not assuming anything. You're not assuming symmetry. You're not assuming how sharp the spectra are. You're not assuming anything. But what this gives you is uh, the extrapolation at infinity of these values. So uh, this is pretty much uh, the same as the first one. This is pretty much the same as the last one, but it will give you the value of the S coordinate for the pure component. Also, if you're not really reaching it, you, you see that you have no pure, no detector in which you have a pure gray, uh, green component, but still you can retrieve it with this. This is even more clear if you look at the uh, G coordinate, because you need to coordinate to that point. Uh, you get the same thing with the green. You get the pure component without really measuring it. And here, uh, with the with the red, it is the same. So you see that this keeps uh, uh, increasing, but it doesn't actually reach uh, the pure uh, the pure com the the real position of the pure component. So, but this is what we can extrapolate. So these colored points uh, will um, represent uh, the pure the position of the position in the phasor plot of the pure component. So why do we care about this? We care about this because we can use them to uh, mix the lifetime uh, by using the lifetime each one of the um, contribution of these components in the detector. So. Once we know this position, we can also know what is the fraction that the first component of the contribution of the first component, the second component, third component in the first pixel, in the first, um, sorry, uh, detection window. We can do this for all of them. And why, again, why do we care about this? Because this we can be scaled by the total number of photons that you get in the channel to retrieve the actual emission spectrum of the probe. So here you can see the comparison with uh, the spectrum obtained from the single measurement, which is the, uh, uh, the solid line, and the spectrum obtained from the unmixing, which is the dashed line, okay? So they're pretty similar, so uh, except from some jagged uh, points, uh, which of course are due to uh, but it's pretty clear that uh, we can actually retrieve the spectrum. But let's not stop to this. Let's uh, use this spectrum, transform the spectrum into spectral phasor, and use them to mix every single point of the lifetime decay. Once we do this, on top of retrieving the spectrum, we can also retrieve the lifetime of each one of the components. So this is pretty cool because uh, this is an example that I showed you, uh, uh, which is done on one press matrix. 
uh, one test matrix corresponds to one pixel. So in principle, you can apply this uh, to the, your entire image, and then you're gonna get uh, a spectral image, a lifetime image for each one of the components that you are mixed. So this will uh, increase uh, exponentially the number of uh, uh, parameters you can look at uh, in your cell. So we're checking the unmixing as well. And uh, uh, let me show you one uh, uh, application uh, of this, which is uh, uh, FRET. So uh, I, I chose FRET because FRET is a relatively uh, common technique to be used. Uh, a lot of people use uh, FRET for like a lot of different uh, applications. And uh, in this case, uh, in this part of my talk, I'm going to show you how the use of the phasor as flame uh, allows you to enormously increase the precision and decrease the interference of other factors in your threat analysis. So uh, recalling again the Jablonski diagram, in the case of threat, you have uh, another floor for uh, close by, typically within uh, nanometers, uh, with specific photophysical properties that um, can allow, with a certain probability, the energy transfer between the first floor floor form called the donor and the second floor form called the acceptor. So when this uh, energy transfer happens, the acceptor will emit fluorescence, even though it's not directly excited, and the donor will uh, decrease the amount of photons emitted because part of the energies will be uh, transferred to the, to the acceptor. Uh, this also influences the lifetime of, this, uh, of the fluorophores, uh, specifically, it, will, it decreases the lifetime of the donor because you have an extra way to lose photons, basically. And uh, it will um, add uh, what is called the rise time. So it's, uh, uh, the, it's a positive uh, exponential, which represents the time it takes for the donor to uh, It's basic, it's related to the energy transfer. So basically, the uh, the rise time is a positive exponential with the same exponential constant as the the donor, the, the quenched donor. To to test uh, whether we can uh, what information we can get from this, rather than use uh, um, complicated uh, samples like biosensors or something uh, more, more complicated, we are using a series of FRET standards, which are based on uh, Cerulean and Venus uh, constants, uh, which are these. So these are basically uh, Cerulean and Venus linked by uh, long linker, short linker, and then we have two versions of the high FRET uh, cases in which you have a multi, uh, two uh, multi-acceptor construct, and you can have threat efficiency up to 76%. Uh, let's see what the threats look like in the case of threat when you have threat. So this is the, the threats of the donor only, the cerulean. This is the threat of the acceptor. You can see that the lifetimes are uh, relatively similar. The spectral emissions are uh, close, relatively overlapping. You can see that the cerulean has a lot of green emission, which overlaps uh, with the emission of the Venus. And uh, let's see what happens when we uh, introduce FRET. So the more FRET increases, you see that now the curves are more are farther apart than before. This is because the donor increasing threat will decrease the lifetime. You can see it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. The acceptor will, uh, will show uh, the rise time, which decreases by increasing threat. So also the donor will shift 
towards shorter lifetime. I would say. In the spectral part of this, uh, you can see that increasing fret, the contribution of the spectrum of the, of the donor decreases more and more and more the more we are increasing the fret efficiency. So how would you um, tackle this problem? Right? So it has been shown that uh, fret by uh, looking at donor quenching, so uh, um, characterizing the lifetime of the donor is more um, robust than uh, intensity-based measurements. So let's look at that. So this is the, what uh, a common uh, flim fret uh, uh, setup will output these uh, uh, values, right? So this is the, the blue, the black is the donor alone. And then you can see that increasing fat, you have uh, the lifetime that sort of decreases. However, so this is in log scale, you can see that most of these curves uh, towards the end, they sort of bend. And that is because uh, they, uh, that means that it's not a pure uh, exponential decay. That may be due to several factors. It can be uh, a background contribution, uh, because of course, the more you have fret, the more the donor quenches. So the less photons you have available for the analysis. So the more the background becomes important. And also you can have some bleed through of the acceptor in the, in the donor channel, especially in the high fret cases. So this will enormously complicate your analysis because you have a ton of parameters to consider to get the actual fret efficiency. And the curves uh, are not that, that great that they allow for uh, a lot of parameters to be used. So, but let's see what happens when we use our mixing algorithm and we look at the donor channel. So this is what we see. So we see a much more uh, clear um, transition to shorter lifetime when uh, uh, fat increases. And also these lines are uh, pretty much all uh, pure exponential. You can see, you can see them as a, lines in, in log scale. So this is because what we're doing is we are mixing the spectrum of the donor from the spectrum of the acceptor from any unknown background that's already present in the cell. And we are looking at the lifetime of each. So uh, what we have as an output is the clean lifetime of the donor. We can also do this in the acceptor uh, channel, uh, which is something that's relatively non-feasible in most of the systems because, uh, as I showed you before, there's a lot of spectral overlap of the donor with the, with the acceptor. Uh, in fact, if you look at this, at this inset, uh, increasing fret, you have uh, the curves are largely similar to each other. Whereas uh, in the phasers flim, you have uh, a nice uh, transition when increasing fret and the lifetime gets closer and closer to the lifetime of the pure uh, acceptor, directly excited. So that gives us two ways to look at fret, actually three ways. So we can determine fret by donor quenching, by the acceptor lifetime, and also since the spectra are uh, completely unmixed and they are not anymore affected by any background in the cell, we can do also a very precise measurement of fret by uh, using uh, the spectral emissions of the donor and the acceptor. So we have three ways that we can simultaneously apply to measure uh, the fret efficiency, right? Also, we're doing this considering every single photon in, that we collect. So we're never, 
we don't use any filter in this approach. So let's see, uh, this maybe uh, clarifies a little bit this point. So this is, these are the curves for the FET constructs uh, for all of the experiments that I showed you before. Uh, this is in the case of emission filter. So you will collect this amount of photons and this amount of, for the donor, this amount of photons for the acceptor. This is the amount of photons that we collect with the same data set uh, by using the phasor s flim approach. So we have approximately three times the amount of photons for each of the spectral emission. But this is misleading because actually in uh, uh, emission filters configurations, you cannot use the acceptor price type because of there's too much spectral overlap. So what we're actually comparing is this amount of photons that comes from the photon quenching to this amount of photons that come from uh, the combined donor quenching, acceptor rise time, uh, spectral threat. So that gives you the same amount of photon in approximately six to 22 times less acquisition time or a six to 22 times more photons available for, for the threat determination. This, of course, uh, that is something that you can use to either increase the speed of your threat acquisition by an order of magnitude or increase dramatically the precision of the determination of the threat efficiency compared to a donor quenching experiment uh, keeping the same uh, pros because uh, we are uh, rejecting any contribution from uh, uh, bleed through or background and so on. Plus, uh, you can look at the same thing from different from three different perspectives. So that gives you much more uh, insights on what is actually going on in your sample. Um, one further application is, uh, which is relatively simple, but can, is so general that can be, used, be applied to anything, is uh, blind uh, three-color flip. So in this case, we have a um, uh, cell. Um, doesn't look like a cell because I'm not, the, the, the focal plane is close to the bottom. So this is a live cell. Uh, with three fluorescent stains that stain uh, the microtubules, mitochondria, and uh, lysosomes. When you apply our uh, a mixing algorithm, what you get is three unmixed images uh, where you can see here, this is the staining of the microtubules, here you have the mitochondria, here you have the lysosomes. So the images are the, the contribution of these three probes are perfectly separated. And each one of these is actually a thin image. So what I showed you here is uh, an extremely fast because it's, uh, it's done using one single uh, excitation wavelength. Three color flim uh, analysis. So this can be used to enormously multiplex uh, both the type of parameters that you're looking at, because you can look at spectral emissions, you can look at lifetime emissions, you can look at whatever you want, and the number of probes that you're using uh, in your analysis. So imagine that this is done in uh, less than uh, 70 nanometers um, in terms of spectral emission. So with one wavelength. So imagine if you can do it with three wavelengths, that will give you a nine color flim, right? So you, you can scale it as, uh, as you're scaling any multicolor experiment that you do uh, with microscopy, but this will be flim and this will be uh, with the, all the photons that you can collect, that you can possibly collect. 
Um, also, this is relatively impossible to do with filters because this emission and this emission are 10 nanometers apart. So it's almost impossible. It's impossible to design filters to, uh, without having any bleed through in any of the spectral channels. In this case, we don't really care. We mix everything and we get the light. So as a bonus, we also have a very high photon yield on top of having the possibility of doing a very uh, highly multiplexed acquisition in, uh, with the not any more regular confocal microscope. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, I want to thank, uh, of course, uh, the lab, uh, especially Enrico, for giving me the possibility to work on this uh, project, which I think is pretty amazing. Uh, all of the um, all uh, of the people in the lab, and uh, also our collaboration with the uh, uh, Flim Labs, which uh, are, uh, is the company that helped us develop the electronics behind. Uh, so, um, and I would like also to thank uh, uh, Lionel for inviting me for giving this talk and uh, all of you for uh, surviving uh, this talk. <laughs> thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, wonderful talk, uh, amazing instrument. Uh, I got tears in my eyes, uh, not only for the instrument, as I already told you, this is uh, the dream of uh, any person working in uh, sovatochromic proofs and this kind of thing. But also, you know what, Lorenzo? I am looking at your back and I, I can see my, my desk. Your old desk. <laughs> <laughs> so there is time for question uh, if there is in the audience. If anyone wants to raise a hand or just well, please. I have a question, uh, which is more a comment. Yeah, that please. Essentially, uh, you do the, the convolution without really knowing anything about the position of the phase of, of the position of the spectrum. Exactly, yes. But you, but, you yeah. recover the, pos the position of the, of the phase that can be even, even not in the universal circle in any other position. So this True, is exactly. In fact, the, for, yeah. in the case of the acceptor, the phasor position is outside the universal yeah. circle. So, so I want to make this, you didn't comment about that, that you didn't say this, I, I cannot pay attention to that, but it's really totally independent of the position. That's true. That is very important because, uh, for instance, for so imagine that uh, you have um, a species which has a multi exponential lifetime, yeah. right? So, it, with the species with multi exponential lifetime, you still have one position in the phasor. So it will give you the same contribution as a single exponential or so. But if you were to fit a multi-exponential decay, you will end up with a, a scale um, parameter for each, of the, for each of the decays and then the decay itself and then a background. So you will end up with five parameters at best, uh, whereas the, with the phasor is just one position and then you can uh, by looking at the actual position that you are mixed, you can say, okay, this is a multi-exponential, for instance. And you can but do all... I want for you to make this comment, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, it's a very good point. Lorenzo, I, I have just a stupid question about the configuration. Um, to, to remove the excitation light from the mission, you use a notch filter, right? Uh, for the wavelength that you are using for excitation, or you don't need um, yeah, no, we're using just the dichroic. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, sometimes, yeah, for the, well, the green is pretty powerful, so we're, um, I, I, I didn't, the dichroic is not that sharp, so for the, yeah, for the green, uh, we're using uh, an emission. It makes sense, because uh, you, you cannot, yes, yes, a long pass. You, you, you cannot notice any, any effect in the spectra that you are collecting, and no matter what, if you include a notch filter, it, it will, it will affect your... No, no, we're using a 500 long pass filter for the... Uh, for the, nice. for the 405, uh, we, don't, we don't do anything. I just, uh, I just disconnect the cables uh, <laughs> for the 405, so you don't record anything there. Okay, okay. 
So I don't see any other question. If there are questions later on during the breakout room, uh, you can uh, please uh, uh, request to include in the breakout room Gul Lorenzo in the chat, and we will be more than happy to assign to him. So let's move. Thank you, Lorenzo, again for the talk. Uh, let's move to the next speaker. Uh, Alex is already there, and we assign the privilege to share the screen, I think, and unmute you. Um, well, I introduced already Alex, but just in case, I would like to say uh, uh, that Alexander Varmishana is postdoc, as well as the Laboratory for Ferries and Dynamics in the Biomedical Engineering Department at the University of California. And um, today, uh, he will be talking about uh, a different thing, a different topic, um, but it's a, a, a very, very interesting uh, method that has been developed at LFD related to 3D orbital tracking. And uh, this was his project when he joined the LFD. And on top of the regular uh, 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 orbital tracking, he was uh, trying to include super resolution with this step microscope that he had there. So thank you, Alex, and I pass the word to you. Hello, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, what are we saying? Am I sharing the full screen or am I sharing the split screen? Yeah, yeah. you are. We are sharing the split screen. You have to avoid that. I just want to do this. Let me. You can go to okay. it. Now it's okay. No? Yeah, but it's not full screen, no? Well, you press the other button down. Let me just unshare for a moment. I think you have to pick the one that you are, uh, uh, where you have the zoom and where, because you are, you, you have two screen. Yeah. So, Pick the screen where you will have sharing in the, the second monitor. Yeah, that's what I did. I just, so now you're seeing, oh, maybe I have to stick the presentation on the other one. And now, so you're still seeing the split? Yeah, yeah. but you, you can go, to, oh, oh, wait, wait, you can go to the top. You, you, you have a, a, a tab that say you can pick what you want to display. Okay. Sorry about this. No worries. <laughs> Share screen. So now you're seeing here. But are you sharing your presentation? Because now we are, I am looking at your desk. Yeah. Because I have the I have a PPT on the other side. It's yeah, but if, 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 if you display the PPT and go down in the line, that that yeah, that, does the same. It's no, okay. No. I'll just share the, the main screen. I was intending to share the side screen. It's okay. Okay. Alex, wait, wait a second. Share the screen, please, and, and wait a second. Can you share the screen? Uh, am I, and put am in, I, can, can you put in full screen the, the presentation? Yeah. No, no. You wow. have the, yeah. Okay. Now on top, you have display settings. Oh, and okay. No, one, the, the one correct. Okay. Perfect. We did um, it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, my presentation is going to be short, so it's okay. We lost a couple of minutes here at the beginning. So yes, thanks for the introduction. And uh, yeah, as Leonel was saying, uh, this is the original project I came to the LFD for. Uh, 3D orbital tracking is this technique that um, Enrico and his collaborators uh, developed. And this is what I'm going to be talking about, but I'm going to have a little introduction on particle tracking in general. Okay, so since uh, the beginning of time, we have been doing particle tracking for hunting for everything. You basically track the position of something and infer the movement and predict the movement. Um, a good example is by looking at the stars. You look every night at the, at the sky and you see that everything is moving. But if you look long enough, you realize that some, some objects are moving with respect to the background. And the early Greeks already had a name for this. Our current name is planet, which is a wanderer, as in a erratic movement object. But they soon realized that it was not such, it's not a erratic movement. It's actually very predictable. So you can, by looking at over the weeks and months, you realize that, well, some objects move slower. So you immediately decide that they're further off, like Saturn and Jupiter, and some objects move, move faster, like the, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, and the Sun. Therefore, they are closer. By taking more precise measurements, i.e. like uh, 
noting the exact position with more precision, they realized that there was a strange movement of going back and forth. And the next model that came up was this fancy model with a clear overfitting with the known epicycles where they say, okay, the planets have to be going forward for a time. And then they kind of go back and then forward again and go back. And it was another 1500 years before 1400, we simplified the model and realized that that was only an artifact of the fact that we are not the center. It's rather that we are orbiting like the rest are. And kind of this is our current model, except for nuances, always again, thanks to better precision in the measurements. Uh, this very particular guy, the Danish uh, Tycho Brahe, he did very precise measurements and said, this uh, circular model cannot be correct. There has to be some combination of motions. And he put Earth at the center, Moon around us, and then so uh, Sun going around us with all the plants around the Sun. And his employee, uh, Kepler, said, no, your measurements are good, but there's a simpler way to explain this, which is our current model, the elliptical um, orbits of the planets. OK, so going from the very um, the large scale of the solar system down to the quantum world is another example. Uh, this is a picture taken with what was called the bubble chamber, which was one of the early um, devices to, to image the smashing of particles under electrical and magnetic fields. And this allowed to, in this case, quantify well, the charge of the particles by the, the rotation under the electrical fields and visualizing the de decays of, of elementary particles. Uh, Alvarez was given the Nobel Prize for de um, developing this, this device. And now going into biology, our own interest. Well, uh, basically, we also have an interest in uh, tracking objects because tracking objects will give us information about what is going on, how they move, why they move, they will. And studying the types of movement can allow us to understand the, the surrounding of the, of the objects we are tracking. Uh, basically, in biology, in life, science, life sciences, everything is moving. So we may have an interest in uh, basically tracking everything that we can see. There are a bunch of examples, like uh, the biophysics of, of membrane um, lipids, the um, tracking viruses. Uh, this is an example from the LFD, um, transcription uh, kinetics of DNA. But there you can anything that you can think of, there has there can be an interest in tracking those objects and studying the motion. So what devices do we have for tracking objects in biology? Well, the first one that you will think of is taking a snapshot, looking at the objects you see, taking another snapshot, another picture, camera based, and so on. So you get a sequence of images and track the objects in, in time. So we kind of put this in the middle of our, our uh, 3D uh, graph where you, we quantify how fast we can acquire each temporal um, frame or each temporal location, so the speed. How big is the range at which we can follow our objects, so the spatial range, x, y in this case, and as we separate from the z, which is color coded in with the color because it's kind of a different field. No? So for example, camera based, well, we obviously don't have any sp spatial range. Um, 4D confocal imaging would be using a confocal instrument in which you're scanning in the X, Y, and then scan another plane and scan another plane in the Z direction. This is very cumbersome. That's why it's so low in the speed axis, but it has a higher Z uh, range. Uh, I will mention also well optical tra tra trapping. I won't even go into this. is a, a technique that has is still used to measure forces at a very small scale. You can trap objects uh, with photons, and you could use it for tracking. But it it has a very very low spatial range, so it's not really used for tracking. Um, and the one technique that uh, is our baby, should we say, is orbital tracking, which as as you can see, we put it at the very top of every range because that is what we are trying to sell. <laughs> and I will try to convince you that this is a very good technique for tracking objects in space. 
with a very wide range and you also have a very high speed in the in the measurements of the location of the of your object in time okay so what does tracking exactly mean well it's basically two things one is to localize your object precisely in space and to be able to do that in successive moments in time I mean, the the idea is very simple but there are many details behind this so uh, the yeah the first idea we all have is as we said a moment ago you take a picture this is an example of uh, mitochondria crawling down up and down a new a neural axon so you have a field of view here and you see the mitochondria and this is successive fields of view so the same field of view successive frames so there's a bunch of different techniques for uh, digital tracking of offline images so you have your sequence of images and there's basically two families, the one that is first detect your objects and then try to uh, map the locations from one temporal frame to the next. And then there's like the inverse, which is kind of a more uh, like, a, uh, it's what they call track before segment. But anyway, the, the idea that everyone has in mind is segment before, so detect what objects are of our interest. And then the tricky part is assigning each one in one temporal frame to itself in the next temporal frame. So, and here's where there's a many, many techniques to do this. So if you eventually manage to identify all of them, which is which in successive frames, then is when you realize that which is the ones that are moving, which are the ones that are not. And that is how you obtain trajectories in the 3D space and 3D spaces and X, Y, T in this case. But of course, this is we're taking a bunch of images in time and we're imaging the whole field of view just to obtain the trajectories of a very few elements in this. So or there's a bunch of dark background pixels that are useless in our measurement of the trajectories. I'll go back to that later. So how, how, how do we measure the precision by which we localize each object? So uh, before I was talking about uh, looking at the stars and probably drawing the position on the sand. In this case, our measurement is a uh, measurement device is a pixel based digital image. And since we're using optical um, instrumentation, we are limited for starters by the diffraction limit. So you've all probably been hearing about the diffraction limit in this during this week. Just as a reminder, it's the expression. This is a uh simplification of the actual expression but it's kind of a good approximation in which you only take into account the wavelength of the light you're using to shine your object and the numerical aperture of your system for our instruments using visible light typically we are talking of a diffraction limit in the range of a quarter of a micron 250 nanometers meaning that that is the smaller distance that we can resolve an object in our images. Another way of looking at it is to say anything that is smaller than that will appear as an object of that size. So anything that is smaller, like in this case of an nanometer scale, you will see it as an object as big as 250 nanometers. So that is an, a, a limitation that we have. Anything you, you would say, okay, so there is no way you can localize any object smaller than at 250 nanometers. But that is not really the case because if your pixel size is smaller than that, you say, okay, I have a few photons on the edge of this object, a few photons on here, many photons in the middle. So you do the, the mean position of all the photons you're collecting and basically it'll map to a location somewhere in the middle here, which is between two pixels. So you can have a sub pixel precision as long as you have enough photons. So that is why the number of photons is the most important thing when determining the location of an object. How do we decide, um, how do we measure, um, quantify the precision? Use the variance of the object. Imagine all the photons are physically coming from a tiny punctual uh, uh, point in space and you're obtaining this diffuse object. So the bigger the object, the worse is your is your localization precision. So what you measure is the variance or sigma squared of the blob that you are imaging. 
you, ideally, this is as, as small as possible. If this is, were down to zero, you have an infinite precision. So that's why the number of photons is in the denominator. That is the, the one most important factor. Then the diffraction limiter is on the numerator. And the diffraction lim, uh, limit also um, is compensated by your pixel size. Because, of course, if your diffraction limit is two, uh, a quarter of a micron, but your pixel size is one micron, then you, your, your pixel size is destroying that diffraction limit and will, or, or multiplying it by four in this case. So you need your pixel to be slightly smaller than the diffraction limit. At the same time, you don't want it to be too small because then you're spreading out your photons in across many, many pixels and you're losing the, the weighted average. So that's why the pixel size is also included down up in so down here, sorry, yeah. And finally also, you want your object to stand out from a background. So the photons that come from other sources that is not the object that you're trying to to track, you want there to be not not too many photons coming from the background. So that is another thing to take into account. Okay. Now, what are the typical measurements we do with tracking? Uh, so once you have a trajectory, what what is a uh, a good way of getting relevant information out, out of that uh, trajectory? Well, the typical that people use is the mean square displacement, and I'll tell you now why is that the case. So suppose that you have an object that is moving randomly and at time zero, it's in a given position. The probability distribution function of finding it in space and time, it turns out is you can model it by a, a Gaussian function. So as you give it more time, the probability of finding it further and further away kind of increases. And at the same time, the probability of finding it in the original step decreases. Um, this the whatever time you measure it the mean position of 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 your part of the whole um, probability distribution function will still be zero a way of thinking of that is instead of one object think of it as you have many many objects in the middle here and then you give them time to spread out so if at ever whatever time you measure the positions of all of them and find the mean it will still be the, the origin the way you quantify the spread in time is again the variance of this Gaussian, the spatial variance, so the the denominator of the exponent of the exponential, and that is that is what is telling how wide your your Gaussian function is. And as you can see, the coefficient in front of the so this is linear with time for starter, which is the important fact, and the coefficient is the diffusion of your objects. So the fact that the variance or the square of the uh, standard deviation depends linearly with time means that the square of the movement is a linear if the movement is random is a straight line in as a function of time so if you're talking about random diffusion you would expect that the mean square displacement is a straight line but if your object is actually moving because there is some directed or as we call it active transport so there is a preference to move in a direction you will see a divergence from this straight line. So just measuring this quantity already can tell you a lot of information of what's going on if in, in the motion of the, of, the, of the particle you're tracking. The opposite of that is if there is something that is, um, there's some, some, some kind of motion against a particular direction, you will see this kind of um, moving away from the, from the linearity. So with a exponent less than one, and if the object is limited in space, you will see that it reaches a, 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 a particular um, spatial um, threshold and it will not survive that. You can also see funny objects like this, a situation like this in which you have some confinement and then it, back, it eventually releases. Okay. So here are some more examples in biology. There's an old example from the eighties and uh, more modern, um, case, but it's basically the same. You're imaging, you get taking images in time and you're finding a way to assign objects from one image to the next. Now, as I said before, you if you are taking so many images and you're only tracking particular objects, you're actually wasting quite a lot of time in, in um, taking the images of all those pixels that are actually background. So here's a, a kind of a technique developed here in the lab that 
takes that into account and says, okay, you have your object. What, what you can do is just scan some frames above and below around a very small range. And if you see it kind of move in on a, in a feedback looping, you just simply scan towards the object so that you're kind of tracking it in 3D, but without actually imaging the whole of your volume of your sample, just imaging a very localized space around your object. In this case, three to six stack planes. So the issue with the 3D imaging, you can choose to make um, frames above and below your object, and that will allow you to track your object in time. It's what we were, we were mentioning, but this is very limited in temporal resolution. But of course, you do have a complete picture of what's going on in the surrounds of, of your object. There is another technique that uh, we that is an interesting to see, that is you, to use the defocus of the particle to infer the actual Z position. So in this case, for example, when the object is above or below, it appears bigger and more spread out because it's out of focus. It's out of sight of your focal plane. And there's even very fancy ways to even distinguish if it's above or below just by inducing some um, aberrations in the system. So astigmatism, for example, is an aberration that will depend on the position above or below. It will kind of spread out in one direction if it's above and in the opposite direction if it's below. Limitation to this, obviously, the Z resolution. The PSF of your object determines how as, as soon as it's further than a couple of microns away, it simply disappears. So you lose, you, you only have a very, very narrow Z um, resolution. The final approach, which is what orbital tracking is based on, is kind of not imaging anything, only imaging very closely around your object and tracking it in time. It's what we call riding the particle. So this gives very high spatial and time resolution with the drawback that you do not have images to compare to. So it's hard to tell if you're actually tracking your object or you kind of lost in space. So orbital tracking. Orbital tracking is based on shining your laser very close to the particle, but not exactly on top of your particle of interest. And that is because if you shine it kind of with the edge of your PSF, you it's where you have the maximum variability. So your maximum sensitivity to a small movement of your of your object. This is an image of uh, PSF, the, the diffraction limited object. You shine your focus, your light into space and your focus is not infinitely small. It has a certain size, as we said, quarter of a micron approximately. And the intensity, so the number of photons in the X, Y direction is modeled by a Gaussian. So it's brightest at the middle, at the exact middle. And as you move away, you can, you get less and less photons and eventually you get none. So notice that the place where the derivative is maximum is exactly the place where if you are shining your object, your fluorescent object with the edge of your PSF and the object suddenly moves slightly away, you get a, a very high a decrease in number of counts. And if your object moves slightly to the, to in, towards the inside of the PSF and when it's at the edge, suddenly you get a lot of counts. So the the, the orbital tracking technique ex exploits this by following the object, going around the object, and only shining with the edge of the PSF, which is where you have the maximum sensitivity in the number of, of photons that you're going to receive. So the idea is you have your object in, the, in some location. Suppose the object is in the middle of this Cartesian um, plane, and you have your PSF, you're shining all, your, all this blob of 250 nanometers uh, radius and you move it around your object always keeping your PSF at the, at, the, at the edge of where the object is. If the object is static and you're perfectly around it the intensity you would expect to receive from your fluorescent particle is constant because it's always at the same distance and the, regardless of the angle at which you're at you would see a constant intensity. Here are three examples of three particles the red the green and the blue which are not at the center of your orbit. So for example, the green and the red are at the same angular position of your orbit so that when your, your PSF is around this area, you get a maximum in intensity. And as you move away, you get less and less intensity to go back to getting high intensity again in the next orbit. Another example is the blue particle here, which is at a different angle. Therefore, your peak intensity is a different location. And the height of the intensity is equivalent to the green because it is at the same radius. So it, 
there's a moment where the object is closer to the center of your PSF, you're shining it with more photons. So the idea behind orbital tracking is none other than this. Um, do orbits around your object, infer where the object is in your within your orbit by the shape of the intensity profile you're obtaining, and then move the next orbit to recenter around your object. And that is how we track our object. How do we do this movement? How do we do these circles around the, the particle? Well, we exploit one of the what well, we exploit the, the microscopes that are based on scanning um, on the scanning technique. So it's a it's a microscope that is usually um, used to raster scan and form images. In the typical way you would form images, you have two little mirrors with two motors at orthogonal directions. You send a voltage to each motor. In this case, you send a voltage that is a jagged um, profile to the X, which forms the horizontal line. So it scans, you sends your laser across the sample in the horizontal way, and you reach to a point where then you suddenly give it a jump in the Y to go down to the next position. The X goes to, or to the origin and you do the next line and the next line and the next line and so on. This is how you form your image in normal scanning confocal microscopy. In our case, what we send to the scanners is a couple of sinusoidal functions, which are shifted 90 degrees one another. And as you know, a sine function and a cosine function summed up give you basically a circular motion. So we can move these two mirrors so that we do circular orbits with the PSF around a point. And if we manage to do it around an object that is bright, and we can then use a feedback um, algorithm to update the location of the new orbit, that is simply shift the voltage up and down. So instead of in this range, maybe shift it up to move to the left, shift it down to move to the right, and so on. And that is how we can move the orbits in space, in the XY space, that is, because the, all of this is confined to the XY space. OK, now, there's a little mathematical interlude here about the Fourier series, because we're going to use that to, to extract the the position of the peak and the phase of the of the peak. So you know that the Fourier series is a series which um, is composed of successive sine and this is this should be a sign here. This is wrong. <laughs> sine and cosine functions with higher and higher harmonics. Each harmonic captures information of lower frequency or higher frequency. There's a theorem that says that any function can be expressed as a Fourier series if you give it enough harmonics. So any shape, even like in this case, a square shape is, tr is being tried to um, model by a sum of n harmonics. If you do just one, well, you basically get a sine function. But as you put more and more and more, you can gradually get closer to whatever shape you're um, trying to describe. Here's another example. Just by using one, you just have one sine function. As you add more and more, you, you, you're adding more detail into your function. Here's another fancy example. You can basically draw anything out of um, enough uh, terms of your harmonic series. Here we see the same, the same drawing, only with five, five terms of the series instead of probably like hundreds in the other one. Now, why am I saying all of this? Well, because we have this algorithm, the fast Fourier transform algorithm, that is very, very fast. And we exploit the fact that this algorithm is very, very fast. And we, to, to obtain the coefficients of the Fourier transform of our profile of the intensity throughout the orbits to find out the position of the peak and the, in the phase and the, and the height. Because, I mean, if I give you this, this profile, you would say, okay, well, let's find the position just just simply maybe smooth it enough to get rid of the noise, um, do the derivative, find the derivative is uh, zero, find the second derivative to ensure that it's a maximum and not a minimum, and so on. But this is much slower compared to simply feeding this profile to the FFT algorithm and obtaining the coefficients of the series. So the way we, um, the quantities we extract from the intensity profile throughout an orbit are the first two terms of the series. This is 
what we call the DC, so the constant term, the term of uh, zero frequency, which is basically the mean of your of your intensity profile, DC, and the AC, which is the mod um, the squared sum of the two terms of first order. Why first order? Well, because typically, if you if you have a single object and you're going around it, you will see a single bump. In this case, the bump corresponds to the object being closer to your PSF at this angle in the orbit. If it's to the left, it means that it's in another angle. No? So when you model this by a sine or cosine function, in this case, the term A would be um, high because it's, sorry, no, low, sine of zero, zero. So this, this could be modeled easily with a sine function. So B would be high, A would be low. In any case, the combination of these two gives us what the AC which is basically the information of where is the peak in this, the first harmonic of the, so ob objects that happen once in our pro density profile. And the coefficient, sorry, the uh, quotient or the ratio between these two quantities is what we call the modulation. So the modulation, as I'll show you later, gives you information of the radial position as opposed to if the object was at the center, the as I said, the intensity should be constant. The other quantity that is important is the phase, which is relatively easy because it's simply the arc tangent of the ratio between the B and the A. So it's the, as I said, if, if the sine is winning over the cosine, it means that the, the maximum is occurring at a particular angle. And if, for example, the peak was at the very beginning, A would be very high, B would be low because the cosine is closer to the fun actual function. So yeah. The modulation gives you information of where in your orbit uh, the object is. If your object is exactly in the center of the orbit, your intensity is basically constant. If your object starts to move to one direction, you start to see a peak when you're scanning in this region where your object, the object is moving towards. And as it moves closer and closer, the peak goes higher and the intensity goes lower in the other ends of the orbit. But as, as the object leaves your orbit and moves away from it, you basically start to get zero intensity. The modulation, therefore, it's the being the ratio of these two quantities, you can use the modulation to find out where within your orbit is. And this is very important because it means that it's okay, you're orbiting around your object and updating every orbit, but you actually know the position of your, the object at every point in your orbit. So the scanners that we use, typically you can do orbits in the millisecond scale, one, one orbit every millisecond, but each point in the orbit is actually in the microsecond scale. So you will have localization of your object, temporal localization in the microsecond scale. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, basically what I was saying here. So the, for one thing, the, there is a region of at which you have the maximum sensitivity. And you see how, how the, the modulation changes with, with the, the, the precision, sorry. Yeah, because the, the other thing is, what is our precision in, in space? I was saying that our localization precision in, in time is in the order of the microsecond, if you're considering every point in the orbit. And again, even if the orbit's size is approximately 100 nanometers or 250, the, the precision in space is, or is a fraction of that because you're getting many measurements throughout the orbit. So the actual precision in, in space is around the, the nanometer, in fact. Okay. Now, we have, I haven't mentioned anything about 3D. How do you, how do you track an object in 3D because all we did was scan orbits in 2D and if it moves away from your center of your orbit, you simply update the position of the next orbit. In order to scan objects in 3D, what we do is do an orbit above and below our object. So you're not doing a single orbit around your object, you're actually doing two orbits. It's more like an eight. You, you have one orbit a bit below and then you move to the top and then down and up and down and up. So instead of two circles, it's, I mean, this is a continuous space so you're doing, it's a loop going up and down, up and down. So what we do is change the position of the focal plane of the confocal plane of the microscope. And for example, if you do an orbit above and you have a, some intensity and you, you do the orbit below and the intensity is much lower, you immediately know that your object is 
closer to the top. So we have a, another modulation, which is the ratio between the intensity up and down, so the difference over the sum. And this tells you immediately if your object is moving up or down. So you can update also in the, in the Z direction. How do you focus up and down in the Z direction? We have basically two ways of doing that. One is with a piezo mount for the objective. Your objective would be screwed onto the piezo mount. And as you can see, there's a little gap here. There's a crystal inside that you can tune. It's, a, it's based on the piezoelectric effect. So you, a voltage applied to it will contract it. So you send a constant voltage at a particular, so that the size of the gap is a particular size and a variation in that voltage will change the, the size. The other option is to use electrical tunable lenses, which are lenses that you can, again, send a voltage and change the, the effective uh, uh, focal point of the plane. So instead of moving your objective up and down, what you do is attach your objective here. Again, you have a screw here, you put your objective on top of this and you're adding an extra lens, which slightly changes the, the, the orientation of the photons that are arriving, therefore changing the focus up of the objective. So in one case, you move up and down the whole objective, and the other case, you change the focus of the objective. Um, this, the electrical tunable lens is much faster in terms of how quick, because there's no mechanical movement, you can simply, so here's the comparison, the, the electrical lens in red and the piezo in, in blue. As we change the voltage up and down, there's, you can see there's a sharp edge, is basically a square function, whereas the other one is more sinusoidal. So you can have faster changes in, in Z direction. Um, limitation is that you can't really change that much. Uh, you don't have that big a Z range, whereas you have much wider Z range here. And the other big limitation is that uh, you're adding an extra optical element to your, to your system. So you have, you're reducing even more the number of photons that are coming to your system from, to your detector. So the, the, the less, lenses you have in the system, the best. And there's another limitation on the piezo mount that I'll mention later. Okay, so this is the basic idea behind our, our orbital tracking system. You have a confocal microscope. Typically, you have a laser shining onto scanning mirrors. You focus, uh, you have a dichroic mirror that sends your light onto the sample, and then you collect the fluorescence on your detector. The difference is that in this case, the scanning mirrors, instead of driving them doing the, the raster imaging, doing the XY normal squared um, grid, you're doing circles around your object. And also you have your nano, uh, sorry, the, the, well, yeah, the piezo or the electrical tunable lens that you are driving from your computer to, to change the position in, in Z up and down. Um, and the feedback tracking algorithm is well, you would you in, in already imagine you have you're doing orbits around your object, your object moves, you did de you detect that because you're tracking the intensity throughout your orbit uh, as you do the orbits around it. And once you know in which direction you have to move your your orbit, you shift towards the new position, and so on. So this is the basically the same idea. You have your position of the scanner, you obtain your intensity profile. You deduce where your your particle is within your orbit, and then update the scanner position. With the Fourier transform step here, which is the step, as we were saying before, how to how to know where the particle position is relative to your pro intensity profile. There is a an, uh, an extra step that is suppose for some reason you lose your your particle. So if the intensity is lower than a certain threshold, what we do is you is to increase the orbit to try and find it if it is cape you movement. Maybe it's moving too fast, maybe for some reason you lost it, whatever reason. So there is kind of a, you try to catch it. Now, this is the actual software that we use. This is this is the SimFCS written by Enrico. And this is the software that not only uses is used for imaging, but it's also used to drive the scanner. So it basically does everything from the acquisition and driving the microscope to the image processing and and the all the correlation techniques that you've been hearing about and and uh, lifetime um, uh, phaser analysis and so on. This is the window that we use for particle tracking, where you have all these uh, different um, parameters to tune. You have a little window that 
shows you you can do a let's say you do a raster scan just a normal scan you see your image and you say okay this is the object i'm interested in tracking then you tell it to whoops go back to go to that position and these parameters here will determine well the size of the, your orbit so the radius of the orbit the number so the time it the laser will spend in each point in the orbit how many points are in the orbit you can do how many orbits you want to do before updating the position you may want to do several because maybe your object is very dim or for many other reasons um sorry i was saying the number of points per orbit the period of the orbit in milliseconds microseconds in this case and basically a bunch of other parameters there should be another one which is that the distance between um, orbits in the z directions and so on and as you're tracking this in real time you will in, in real um, space time and space you will see how it's moving and you would see a trajectory in the 3d space here this window here would show you the the actual intensity profile throughout the orbit this is 128 because we have 128 points in an orbit down here so you would see at the beginning a certain bulb and as the object locks in the, the orbit locks in the object you would see a constant trajectory throughout the as the object is being moved up and down. Okay, and some of the unique features of of this technique, well, for starters, that nothing um, prevents you from tracking multiple particles. You can do say an orbit around an, uh, one particle, then move to the other one, do an orbit, to go back and track several at the same time at the cost of yeah lo losing half the temporal resolution. But you you can do it. You can combine it with super resolution, which is what Leonor was saying. The instrument we have here is a STED microscope, so we, you can do orbital tracking under uh, super resolution. Are we close to time, Leonel? So you can do lifetime imaging at the same time because the device is also a lifetime detector. And you can do a bunch of other techniques that you've just heard about here, like correlation analysis. About correlation, you've heard about line scans. You do a Typically, a line scan is you do a line scan and then you put the next line scan in time. This is a circular line scan. You can do what we call the carpet image. So you get the intensity profile in each orbit and have them in, in time. And you can use these orbits, these carpets, to do uh, correlation analysis and infer, infer um, uh, properties of the surrounding space. You can also measure the, sh the shape because if your object is not perfectly circular, you will detect it as a double peak and so on. So you can use the high harmonics of your Fourier transform to extract information of the shape of your object. And talking about the shape, if your object is very big, instead of going around it, you can maybe do kind of a petal motion going in and out and detecting where this is your PSF, this is your object that has a certain size, and you go in and out and kind of make a map of the actual shape of their object in 3D and extract meaningful information of the of your of the structure of whatever you're tracking. So instead of doing particle tracking of a particular object, you're kind of getting information of the the shape. As I said, super resolution. This is an orbit intensity for regular, regular confocal and under stead uh, microscopy. It becomes much narrower. You can because the PSF is much narrower. You can do smaller objects, so you increase not only in temporal, not only in spatial, but also in in temporal resolution. Limitations. I have mentioned one already. The first one we will know is photo bleaching. So you can't really track forever because eventually your your fluorescent particles will bleach out. You'd say, well, you're you're for one thing, you're hitting your object with the edge of the PSF, so you're not shining with all the photons, but that is true, but you're also hitting it all the time. When you do regular imaging, you only go by over your object once and then you go to the bottom and start again. So the amount of photons that they receive is quite a lot. The other limitation is that the, the PSO mount cannot be used with oil objectives because the, the objective is, a, is coupled to your sample. So if you're moving up and down your objective, you're basically moving your sample as well. This is a measurement taking in which this was happening. So you have to have air uh, air objectives. You have you need a gap between the the objective and the and the sample. And the other limitation is, you can't have very crowded environments because basically it all becomes a mess. How are we on time, uh, Leonel? We are more or less in time. Shall I mention these applications? It's three slides. Yeah. So we have uh, three examples of applications. Um, in which we use orbital tracking 
This is a study that was done by members of our lab. I think you're getting a talk by Francesco later on, um, in which he was uh, tracking the nuclear pore. This is the the nuclear envelope. This is inside the nuclear the nucleus of the cell, and this is the cytoplasm. And he's tracking a nuclear pore in time, while he's um, he has basically uh, the importines uh, tagged with a, a GFP. Sorry, no, then, yeah, with, sorry, uh, GFP fluorescent uh, protein. And by tracking the pore in time, you can see using for, uh, correlation techniques, you can ev eventually capture the movement of the importines going, shuttling stuff into the uh, nucleus and out of the uh, nucleus. You see kind of the, the correlation from, at some time you eventually see the, the importine coming back. So there is a particular time, characteristic time, at which that takes the importance to go in and then shuttle out again. Here's another study that uh, we use the same technique. This is regarding measuring the tension of collagen fibers. So the, the samples were had collagen fibers attached to the bottom of the sample and they were kind of floating up into the, into the Z direction. And by doing orbital tracking around different sections, so this is a particular section of a particular collagen fiber and up as you move to a different Z plane, it's the same guys here. And we were doing orbital tracking of the same collagen fiber at different heights to see how there was a uh, confinement in a different, different confinement at different heights, therefore extracting the amplitude of the vibration and also the temporal characteristics of the vibration. And the final application I wanted to show is regarding uh, budding of HIV virus. So these, these are uh, virus-like particles on the surface of a membrane. We're seeing the, <clears throat> the membrane of the cell from on top. And by doing orbital tracking on the virus, when it's still attached to the membrane and it starts to bud out, uh, this was orbital tracking done in two channels at the same time. So you're acquiring information in two separate channels. One is the red fluorescence, the other is the green. In this case, the, the green is the, the actual orbital tracking feedback algorithm is using the green. And the red is uh, the fluorescence signal that is attached to the, um, the proteins that are involved in doing the actual budding off the surface of the membrane. So that when there's a peak in the intensity of, in the red channel, indicates the moment at which your object, your uh, virus-like particle starts to drift off. It's the moment it's been detached from the membrane. And you can clearly see this by mapping the, the, the temporal moment of your peak in the signal on the red channel to the moment where the diffusion starts to grow fast and fast. Here you, you see the actual trajectory. This is the moment approximately here where it starts to move away from the membrane. And that's it. Please, thanks for your attention and any questions? Thanks, Alex. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this presentation, this wonderful technique that combined with all the other possibilities uh, developed at LAT give you the chance to do anything yeah. you want you know in a way uh, you can do flim you can do all the other things well yeah. I, uh, we are a little bit over the time i will ask one question and then we will move to the uh, room break room okay um the question is here uh, and it says um is there a case is there a case in orbital tracking where the gaussian does not work and one might have to use uh, Bayesian interference. Uh, what do you mean by the Gaussian does not work? In what sense? Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe Amit can mute and explain better. Uh, I think it means the point spread, point spread function is the Gaussian. Oh, if the point spread function is not Gaussian. No, that shouldn't be a problem. I mean, even if it's not a, if it's not a, a Gaussian, there's always it's always bright in the middle and it decreases with distance. Were you referring to that, Amir? Yeah, no, I mean like if you have a diffusion process where you're not able to like do it because you can have a stochastic diffusion process, right? Which is not modeled well with Gaussian. So would that be a problem? When no, no, it would not. No, no. I mean the 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 modeling of the motion as a Gaussian is just to show that the the random motion, so the so that the mean square displacement is. Is a straight line if it's uh, the the motion is random, as okay. long as the motion you say it's stochastic motion, as long as it's not faster than the time you can actually do the orbit, there's okay. no problem. Yeah, you can track any kind of motion. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, there is another little question here regarding to uh, how are you, how uh, can you be sure that you are tracking the same particle? <laughs> That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, that experience I would say because yeah, so you do an image of your field of view, select what you're going to track, track it, and then when you finish doing that, you do not track it until it bleaches out because then when you stop tracking it, you won't be able to take the final image to make sure that it's there. So. Ideally, track it for some minutes. In this case, the virus, like we were tracking them for three minutes, as you can see, 180 seconds. Stop the tracking and then take another snapshot, another image to make sure that you're at this correct plane and you can still see the object there. Okay. And during uh, the tracking, you don't know. Sorry, yes. Another, another explanation is that if you have two particles coming together, the modulation of the first admonic is complicated. Yeah. So if you look at the graph of the modulation, oh, yeah. First of morning, as a function of time, you can tell if another particle comes. Through. Yeah, if you're following your track, your object, the intensity profile is flat. If you suddenly see a squiggly line, there's something going on there. It's probably found another bright object, or it's, you know, and, and you you don't really know if you you lost it or you didn't. So yeah, if if the intensity profile stays flat, so as Enrico says, the modulation stays low, we should be you should be you good. Okay, so we will go. Can for I ask a quick question. Yeah, sure. Again, I've asked this before, but I want to see what Alex's point is. How bright do these particles have to be? In other words, can you do a one GFP or do you have to have a few together? I think I think you need a what well, yeah, I think you need a few. GFP will I think would it will photo bleach fast. So well, you can have non photo bleachable, but is it bright enough? That's the issue. It'll depend on the background. It'll depend on it's yeah. It's hard to answer a question like that. I think because it's too too much to take into account. In principle, you can do single molecule. I mean, our detectors are you know they are are very sensitive, but depends on not, the background and everything. Exactly. Saying. Yeah. Yeah. But the brighter, the better. Obviously. Always. Yeah. As Enrico says, everything goes like the number of photons. Yeah. Okay. We will go to the breakout rooms um, and we will assign to the person who has a um, request and uh, we will recombine in, I will say, 10 minutes, less, less than the minute because uh, at 16.15 uh, we have uh, Francesco and Francesco is from the other side. He's uh, in Italy and he's very late there. So I promise him to be on time.